All right, everyone, now we're going to be taking a look at carbohydrates. I previously, a long time ago, recorded a video called Carbohydrates, Lipids, and Proteins. And it was very colorful, and it gave a general overview of what carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins are. Uh, we're going to go into a lot of that in, a more, in more detail now, and we're going to be taking a look first at carbohydrates. So with carbohydrates, as with we did with amino acids before, you have to understand how these little molecules, these monomers, can actually link together to form larger molecules. Uh, in this case, specifically, uh, we are calling them monosaccharide monomers, and then we're going to join them together to form double units called disaccharides, or m lots of them joined together, they're going to be called polysaccharides. And these monosaccharides can join together in many different ways. So here's my little Lego analogy here. Lego plus Lego makes two Legos connected together, and there's water dripping out in between them, because this is actually a condensation reaction. I have another video using amino acids, where I show in more detail how condensation works. But the principle applies to pretty much building all of the major macromolecules in biology, you take one, you add it to another, you find a water molecule that can come off, and the water molecule comes off. And then that's called condensation reaction. In order to separate it out, you basically add another water molecule back in, and then that's how you can separate larger molecules into smaller pieces. So that's called condensation. And what we're going to be seeing in a little bit, so I is quite important so i want to draw your attention to these annoying numbers right here that you have to know and you have to be able to recognize and count them so it's actually pretty important especially if you're doing higher level biology because you need to be able to understand something called the five prime to three prime direction with the most important concept in biology and genetics which is transcription and translation so see how these carbons are numbered if you do chemistry then you probably understand this they didn't write c in here for any of these carbons this is a glucose molecule and i know the formula for glucose and you should too it's c6h12o6 right so if you actually look each one of these corners here is supposed to be a carbon atom and we actually number them like this and it's consistent around the world so make sure you remember this when you look at an, a glucose molecule you have to start from the right and you number one two three four five six going clockwise all the way around every one of these is the same so notice if i join these two glucose molecules here and i steal a water molecule so this is going to turn into h2o it's going to leave i'm joining the one and the four bond so this is going to be called a one four bond. If you're really nerdy, you can call it a 1,4 glycosidic bond, which means a bond that's formed between two monosaccharides. That's only when we're talking about carbs, carbohydrates. Also, you can have this happen where carbon number six and carbon number one are joining together to lose a water molecule, a condensation reaction. That is called a 1,6 glycosidic bond, G L Y. C-O-S-I-D-I-C, -I -I glycosidic bond. Forgot to add that. It's, it's okay. It's only for you nerds out there. So one to four glycosidic bond and a one to six bond. Depending on how glucose molecules link up, it can change the properties of them completely. And you can actually take glucose molecules and join them up in many different ways and create things like cellulose, like starch, and stuff like, what's the last one? Glycogen. And those can be made up of smaller bits called amylose and amylopectin. So watch out for all these numbers as we look at some of the specifics in the next few slides. Okay, this is just a repeat of some of the stuff that you've seen before, but just briefly, monosaccharides are the single monomer subunits of carbohydrates, the large group of macromolecules called carbohydrates. So the small subunits, the small Lego pieces are called monosaccharides. You can join two of them together to create a disaccharide. So for example, here are a couple disaccharides you can make. If you take glucose and you add it to another glucose, you get maltose. If you take glucose, add it to galactose, these are both individual subunits called monosaccharides you get lactose which is the sugar that's found in milk you can take glucose and fructose add them together and you get sucrose sucrose is the main uh, organic carbohydrate that uh, plants kind of transport around in their tubes called phloem 
some other points to take note of that won't really be asked as specific questions, but for general background knowledge, if you look at the general structure, uh, the chemical formula for some of these carbs, ribose happens to be C5H10O5, glucose is C6H12O6. You'll notice there's a pattern here where hydrogen and oxygen are in this one two to one ratio. I forgot about carbon, sorry. Carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen are in one to one ratio, one to one ratio as well too. Here's just another picture showing two monosaccharide subunits that will join together and you notice an H2O molecule is dropping off in order to cause condensation. You can reverse it by adding water and then it's going to go back. Again, I have another video uh, where you can look at how two amino acids are joining together. You should be able to draw that out. I don't think you're expected to be able to draw these diagrams out, but you should be able to recognize the diagrams and be able to pick out what is a glucose molecule and what is a ribose molecule. Hexagon, pentagon. Okay, to make things even more annoying and worse, you have to understand that there are different forms of this ring glucose molecule. Notice that this glucose molecule has a beta in front of it and it has a D. Why does it have that? Well, there can be an alpha version and there can be an L in front of here. Um, I don't think you need to get too worried about the difference between the D and the L. It's basically how certain H's and OH's are arranged in the three-dimensional structure. But I will point them out on this slide so you can understand why we need to put the beta and the alpha in front of them. I doubt there will be a question that will ask you, try to catch you out and say, ha ha, gotcha, it's alpha, not beta, of the types of glucose molecules. Think big picture here. I'm going out on a limb and saying it's Good to know that. I mean, if you're really going for seven, you probably should know the difference between the alpha and the beta, at least when trying to identify uh, these three types of polysaccharides, cellulose, glycogen, and starch. They're all made up of glucose, but they differ. And so that's what they want you to know. They want you to understand that the way that glucose molecules are arranged and the type of glucose molecules that are used will produce three very different polysaccharides. So there's going to be a lot of stuff that's on this slide, and I'm not going to read through all of it, but you can pause and you can take a look. You really need to know the difference between these three polysaccharides and where they can be found and what their function is. So before I reveal everything beneath, see if you can remember why these things are significant. You should know that cellulose helps make up plant cell walls. Cellulose is in plant cell walls. We don't have any of this in our body. And when I eat this little plant right here, when I pull it out of the ground and shove it into my mouth and chew it, the cellulose I cannot digest. Even though it's made up of glucose, potentially there's a lot of sugar in there that I can have. But my stupid body doesn't know how to break down cellulose. I don't have the enzymes to break down cellulose. So this forms part of the fiber that makes my poop. And I guess that's good because without it, my poop wouldn't move. And so I like moving poop. Therefore, cellulose in plant cell walls is something to be appreciated. Glycogen is something that is in my body. This is how my body and your body and most animal bodies store extra glucose. We turn it into chains of glucose in the form of glycogen and we store them in our liver. Starch, we do not have in our body unless we've just eaten something. And we can digest starch, thank goodness. When I eat rice and I eat pasta, I am breaking down starch. Plants make starch. Plants take glucose from photosynthesis and build it up into starch. Potatoes save this stuff, potato plants, sorry, save this stuff in their potatoes for food storage, for when it gets cold and they can't do photosynthesis. And we go and kill them and then take the potatoes and make potato chips and french fries. Sometimes it's okay to be a little bit evil. So now I shall reveal the unlimited amount of infinity text here for you to take a look at and then I'm going to run through this really quickly so you can understand. This is quite a lot to handle, so hang in there a little bit. I already mentioned these two points the link between glucose subunits. I said, remember, you can join the first carbon with the fourth carbon. You could also occasionally join the first carbon with the sixth carbon. It's a 1-4 bond or a 1-6 bond. We're going to see that here, and we're going to see that here, and we're going to see that here. So cellulose, the stuff that makes up plant cell walls, plant cell walls already mentioned here, are actually linked together like this. And it's just as you expected, condensation reaction. But what you need to do to understand 
to differentiate cellulose from these other guys is that it's beta glucose. All of these use D glucose. We almost don't care about that. So just remember it's D glucose. But beta glucose in straight unbranched chains, these are actually one four. I didn't mention that here. Let's put it. These are actually one four bonds with beta glucose. So in short, cellulose, one four bonds with beta glucose. That's how you make cellulose. So what's the difference between beta glucose and alpha glucose is basically the location of this OH at the side. If they're facing opposite directions, these are actually complex three-dimensional molecules. But for now, when you draw it on paper, it just kind of looks like this. This is the beta form where the OH is sticking up on the right. When it's sticking down on the right, this is the alpha form. I don't think you have to distinguish between these actual things, so don't worry about it. Just know that there are uh, one six bonds and there are one four bonds, and some of these happen between beta glucose molecules and some of them happen between alpha glucose molecules. So it turns out starch looks like this. Starch is also made up of chains of glucose molecules, but it's broken up into two parts. There's amylose and there's amylopectin. Amylose is when you get 1-4 bonds between alpha glucose molecules. So 1-4, I can actually count. See, look over here, this will be 1, this will be 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. This next one will be 1, two, three, four, five, and six. See this bond right here? That's between a one and a four. And so this part right here that I'm looking at, this is actually amylose. If another glucose molecule up here actually joins and a six joins to the one right here, that would actually be amylopectin. So we would call this particular area here, this branching part, amylopectin. Uh, plants use starch as their storage form. I already mentioned that before I showed you all these words. And the branching allows for quick loading and unloading of glucose uh, if we're talking about transport in the phloem. Finally, glycogen is the way that we store things. So the most significant parts here, recognize now we're talking back to alpha glucose molecules. There are one six linkages here and they are more branched than amylopectin. So there's more branches that are actually happening in the structure of glycogen. This is something that my body can actually produce. I cannot produce starch and I cannot produce cellulose. Okay. Mammals store glycogen, I mentioned already, in our liver and we break down glycogen to glucose when I need extra sugar. Uh, when, for example, my body kicks in and says, hey, your blood sugar is really low. So a hormone, actually, this is a good place to mention so you don't get confused. There's another word, a hormone, glucagon, which is opposite to insulin. People get this confused all the time, so I'll mention it here. But in the homeostasis unit, you'll learn about these. But they are related because glucagon is a hormone that tells your body to break down glycogen into glucose when your blood sugar is low and it helps you out. It's insoluble, doesn't dissolve in water. And this last point is just a bonus here to make you happy. Why don't we just store glucose directly? Why do we have to convert it into glycogen and actually store it? The answer is if glucose is stored uh, because of osmosis, water would enter the cells and make them all full and fat and crazy and then they would burst and then we would all die. So we need glycogen as a storage carbohydrate. Okay, that was tons of information about carbohydrates. Uh, lipids will be up next, so make sure you go through this. Sorry about this 1416 alpha beta business, but uh, go back through, make a little note. I'm sure you can summarize this in smaller bullets, but you really need to make sure you have all the details if you're really aiming for a 7 in case that weird random question out of nowhere shows up.